corrupted government. The present regime of Gautabe Karadipaksa is corrupted so much so that we don't even have basic health facilities in Sri Lanka. So we are protesting to tell you to step down. Protesters on the road. A developing law and order situation with citizens directly in conflict against the forces. One of the houses of the Prime Minister being torched. Prolonged power cuts, lack of food, inflated costs of all necessities, downgraded sovereign rating by most international agencies, almost negligible foreign reserves, dented tax revenues due to the pandemic with faltering exports and a soaring high public debt that has rendered the existence of the Raj Paksha lobby futile and has ushered the fall of the government. Sounds like the opening of a political horror. Well, this is the state of Sri Lanka. This is the ongoing Sri Lankan economic crisis. What? Why? How? Well, all your questions are relevant and will be addressed in today's video. So hold on tight and without much ado, let's discuss what caused the Sri Lankan economic crisis? So the economic crisis that is all over the news, is it new? Well, no. The clouds of economic doom were visible in early 2021 itself when the international agencies began citing the government's weak economic situation as a reason for downgrading them. SNB Global Ratings downgraded Sri Lanka's long-term sovereign credit ratings and the pandemic had destroyed the island nation's revenue. Therefore, servicing the debt would be an issue. External factors including weak revenue from textile and garment exports and lowered payments also contributed to the downgrade of Sri Lanka's ratings. The Sri Lankan government, however, back in 2021, dismissed these predictions as baseless. The island nation has a debt addiction and it cannot be attributed to China alone, for the monetary support from Beijing is relatively a recent phenomenon. The debt addiction problem is compounded by structural weaknesses within the economy, which include a lack of foreign investments, negligible expansion of a tax base and failure to expand the exports. The pandemic which dented tourism across the globe, a critical source of revenue for Sri Lanka and the recent war in Ukraine which sent the crude prices for a toss only worsened the problems for the Rajpaksha regime. Simply put, Sri Lankans were cashing more debt than their revenue could service. The pandemic resulted in low oil prices, curbed Sri Lanka's capital outflows by almost 1.3 billion. But the temporary fall in crude prices was not going to delay the inevitable economic crisis. If one looks at the debt-to-GDP ratio for the last half-century for Sri Lanka, a pattern of dependency on loan emerges. Across the 1970s and 1980s, the public debt steadily increased with a significant increase in foreign debt. Before peaking in the late 1980s, when the public debt was more than 100% of the GDP. So, why all the trouble now? Well, across the 1990s, Sri Lanka's foreign debt was made up of concessionary loans, sourced from the likes of the World Bank and Asian Development Bank. And they came with a long payback period and low interest rates, giving the government a strong cushion for repayment. Thus, at that point, the foreign debt payable after 20 years minimum was not at all a threat to the servicing capacity of Sri Lanka. However, as in the case of all free lunches, the concessionary loan spree also came to an end in 2000s and the country had to move towards commercial borrowing with a significantly higher rate of interest and without the ease of payback. This is where the problem began. 
As per the data of Sri Lanka's Central Bank in 2004, commercial borrowings made up less than 5% of the total foreign debt, with over 95% of foreign debt in concessionary loans. By 2010, commercial borrowings were close to 40% of Sri Lanka's foreign debt and by 2019, more than 55%. The commercial borrowings were in the form of ISBs or international sovereign bonds that were used to raise money from the global markets. As the bonds matured, the foreign debt only increased and with every bond payment, a large outflow of foreign exchange was also happening. For instance, Sri Lanka has an ISB worth a billion dollars maturing in July 2022. Meanwhile, all these years the debt was growing, but the economy was stagnant. The International Monetary Fund IMF, had to bail out Sri Lanka on two separate occasions. Once in 2009, when the economy was struggling due to the global financial crisis, the IMF loaned $2.6 billion to the island nation, stating that it was to help the country's short-term needs and the impending balance of payment situation. Back in 2009 as well, Sri Lanka's exports suffered due to the crisis, especially those of tea and textiles and capital outflows. Yet across the 2010s, the government in the country failed to address the structural problems. In 2016, the IMF had to again come to the rescue of Sri Lanka with a loan of 1.5 billion. This time, the balance of payments crisis had been triggered by huge capital outflows due to the servicing of foreign debt and maturing bonds. Cut to 2022, and the Sri Lankan government, given to its poor ratings, cannot go back to the tried and tested formula of ISBs to raise money from the financial market. In April, the government suspended all payments of foreign debts, raising concerns among the investors. But this was not the end. The government, on its plea to be woke, ended up adding to the crisis. In April 2021, the Sri Lankan government banned the import and usage of synthetic fertilizers and decided to go organic? For an island nation dependent on agri-exports and with more than 60% population directly or indirectly dependent on farming, the move was economically suicidal. Thus, Sri Lanka had to now worry about food security, was importing rice and was unable to export as much tea as it was doing before. The production came down to 2.92 million tons in 2021 to 2022 from 3.39 million tons the previous year. Today, the island nation battles with the consequent inflation as high as 19% even for the most essential commodities. The blunder of its economic history does not stop here. For the Rajpaksha government, after taking over in 2019, went on tax cuts reducing the value-added tax to 8% from the 15% and doing away with the 2% tax on domestic goods and services. Compared to 2019, there was a 30-odd percent decrease in tax income for the government. The pandemic in 2020 was the final nail in the coffin. Do you know China also has a role to play? China makes up for one-fifth of Sri Lanka's current debt, but over one-third of the debt comes from the commercial borrowings that began in the early 2000s. That is where the story of Sri Lanka's economic doom begins. Thus, even if China were to restructure its debt, take over all the infrastructure projects it has invested in. In the following years, 50% of the public debt in the nation would be to service the ISBs. China or no China. Without structural fixes, Sri Lanka's economy is in an uncontrolled spiral downwards. There is a lesson for politicians, fans of freebies in other developing nations as well. To slash taxes or divert state resources towards fulfilling waivers is an idea that wins elections, but in the long run only weakens the state. For Sri Lanka, the hope lies in an IMF bailout, long-term credit at low interest rates from India and China. 
restructuring of existing debt and renegotiation with current bondholders and creditors and most importantly addressing the structural issues that have plagued their economy for a decade now do not repeat the mistakes of 2009 2016 and 2019 now that we know where sri lanka's hopes lie do you know where world of works looks for hope at you at our world of works family so you know what to do comment your views like our videos and share them with fellow enthusiasts until we meet next Stay curious, stay awesome. World of Vogue's signing off.